Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions Since World War II, the updated edition, by William Blum, Common Courage Press, 2004. The key ideas of this text are the twofold concepts that A, U.S. foreign policy is very active in almost every country and government around the world, and yet this history is essentially absent from public knowledge. And B, you can't look at U.S. foreign policy through a moral lens. Once you realize this, the bombing, political unrest, resource exploitation are no longer irrational outcomes of a rational system, but rather the rational outcomes of an expanding empire. I'm reviewing this book because of the recent Senate report on, CIA on the CIA interrogation program titled uh, The Committee Study of the Central Intelligence Agency's Detention Interrogation Program, which reported that the CIA's use of its enhanced interrogation techniques was not an effective means of acquiring intelligence or gaining cooperation from de detainees. And that the interrogations of CIA detainees were brutal and far worse than the CIA represented uh, to policymakers and others. Uh, for example, uh, some of the techniques used were rectal rehydration, rectal feeding, uh, prisoners with injuries on their legs forced to stand on their injuries, threats of rape of children and other family members, mock executions, Russian roulette, waterboarding, prisoners kept awake for over a week causing hallucinations, Prisoners kept in sensory deprivation, in total darkness, white noise playing as they're shackled to walls or the floor, a prisoner being placed in a box the size of a coffin for over 11 days, and forcing a prisoner to stand with his hands over his head for two and a half days. Wanting uh, to do a review focusing on U.S. support of torture, I thought about William Bloom's, uh, Blum's book, Rogue State. Uh, which has highlights of CIA manuals in it and even has a whole chapter on U.S. support of torture. However, I haven't read the book entirely, so I can't review it just yet. So instead, I've chosen to review William Blum's other signature work, Killing Hope. If you are insane about U.S. foreign policy like myself, this book is a must-have. Uh, for the more sane, I still recommend this book because every good citizen needs this foreign policy encyclopedia. I use the book every time the media starts railing against a country uh, for being corrupt, uh, having uh, s suffering political instability, having f uh, fanatical leadership, depicting the country as what William Blum calls an ODE, officially designated enemy, preparing the U.S. public to accept military action in that area. I simply flip to the index of Killing Hope or flip through the chapters for the country named and see what the U.S. military relationship has been with that country so that I'm better prepared to sift through the major media's lens. This book is an encyclopedia of U.S. involvement in rigged elections, bombings, assassinations, propaganda, torture, overthrow of governments. Uh, Crash Course U.S. History for the YouTube Savvy is, a good, uh, is good for a crash course, but in a way, it's like talking to uh, the average American. Less than 10 U.S. wars ever get mentioned. Uh, all the other overthrow and covert actions go completely unmentioned. Uh, Hip Hughes History uh, does an excellent job with addressing the history behind current issues like uh, ISIS or Ferguson. Uh, as far as the context of this book, uh, Hip Hughes History is also good at looking into uh, the Gulf War, Iran-Contra affair, Korea War, the Cold War in general. Uh, these are good sources, but they don't come close to the uh, detail and scope of William Blum's work. This text consists of over 60 examples of U.S. military invasions in foreign countries from China in 1945 to Haiti in 1994. There's also chapters about the American Empire uh, 1994 to present, which is 2004 for this text. Uh, and there's also several appendices explaining the flow of money through the CIA, uh, one that shows U.S. military force abroad uh, 1790 to 1945, and a list of U.S. assassination plots. I wish the list was divided into successful and unsuccessful assassinations, but that's not the case. I also wish there was a clear distinction chapter by chapter uh, whether the chapter involved bombing, assassination, funding a political, ca uh, political campaign, etc., for easy reference purposes. However, Blum does do this in uh, his book Rogue States, uh, which has specific chapters on bombing, assassination, torture, etc. 
Uh, because there are almost 60 chapters in this text, and since the recent CIA torture report is the inspiration of this review, I decided to focus on the few uh, chapters that deal exclusively with uh, U.S. support of torture. I apologize in advance, this might get a little heavy. Firstly, Chapter 33, Uruguay, 1964 to 1970. This chapter starts with a quote from uh, Dan Matrone, uh, Matroni, the head of the Office of Public Safety, a division of the Agency for International Development, uh, more commonly known as USAID. The quote goes as follows. The precise pain in the precise place in the precise amount for the desired effect. The OPS had been operating formally in Uruguay since 1965, supplying the police with the equipment, arms, and training it was created to do. Blum explains that the OPS team uh, with, uh, with CIA operators developed the Department of Information and Intelligence, the DII, which provided funds and equipment, uh, some of the equipment innovated by the CIA's Technical Service Division for the purpose of torture. Uh, one torture device named was a thin wire that could be wrapped between the teeth or pressed up against the gums and pumped with an electric current. Other types of torture blum names are uh, electric shock to the genitals, elect uh, electric needles under the fingernails, burning with cigarettes, slow compression of the testicles, and daily use of psychological torture. Blum explains that in 1981, a former Uruguayan intelligence officer declared that U.S. manuals were being used to teach techniques of torture to his country's military. He said that most of the officers who trained him had attended classes run by the United States in Panama. In a leading Brazilian newspaper in 1970, it was explained that a former Uruguayan chief of police intelligence, uh, Alejandro Otero, declared that U.S. advisors, and in particular Metroni, had instituted torture as a more routine measure. Blum gives a statement by Manuel Casulella, who worked with Dan Metroni, and who explained that Matroni had a soundproof room under his house where he would teach torture techniques using Uruguayan beggars, four of whom died. During the mid-1970s, however, Congress enacted several pieces of legislation which abolished the entire public safety program. In its time, the OPS had provided training for more than one million policemen in the Third World. Blum alleges that the OPS functions have essentially been taken over by the DEA and are still in effect. Chapter 35, Greece, 1964 to 1974. The Greek Intelligence Service, KYP, was created by the CIA in the course of the Civil War with hundreds of officers being trained in the U.S. The U.S. provided the junta with ample military hardware despite an official congressional embargo. James Beckett, an American attorney sent to Greece by Amnesty International, wrote in December of 1969 that people have been mercilessly tortured simply for being in possession of a leaflet criticizing the regime. Beck reported that some torturers have told prisoners that some of the equipment had come as U.S. military aid. A cable whip and head screws were two of the items named. The Amnesty delegation described a number of other torture methods commonly employed. Among these were A. Beating the soles of the feet with a stick or pipe. After four months of this, the soles of one prisoner were covered with thick scar tissue. Another was crippled by broken bones. B. Numerous incidents of sexually oriented torture shoving fingers or an object into the vagina and twisting and tearing brutally, also done with the anus, or a tube of water is inserted into the anus and water driven under high pressure. C. Uh, techniques of gagging. The throat is grasped in such a way that the windpipe is cut off, or a filthy rag often soaked in urine and sometimes excrement is shoved down the throat. D. Tearing out of hair from the head and pubic region, E, jumping on the stomach, and F, pulling out toes and fingernails. Chief Inspector Basil Lamboro, a well-known torturer, would tell prisoners, you make yourself ridiculous if you think you can do anything. The world is divided in two. There are communists on that side, and on this side, the free world. The Russians and the Americans, no one else. What are we? Americans. Behind me is the government.
Behind the government is NATO. Behind NATO is the U.S. You can't fight us. We're Americans. <clears throat> Chapter 37, Guatemala, 1962 to the 1980s. Blum, then ex Blum explains that through the late 60s and early 70s, U.S. aid agency and its Office of Public Safety in alliance with the CIA, trained 30,000 Guatemalan police with CIA operatives acting at all levels of the operation. Despite an embargo due to human rights abuses, the Reagan administration was able to give $3.1 million in jeeps and trucks, $4 million in helicopter parts, and $6.3 million in other military supplies to the regime. In a newspaper article from 1983, it states, Indians tell harrowing stories of village raids in which their homes have been burned, men tortured hideously and killed, women raped, and scarce crops destroyed. It is Guatemala's final solution to insurgency. Only mass slaughter of the Indians will prevent them from joining the mass uprising. From 1966 to 68, Amnesty International estimated that somewhere between 3,000 and 8,000 Guatemalans were killed by the police and military and right-wing death squads. By 72, the victims were estimated at 13,000, and by 76, estimated at over 20,000. Blum explains that whole villages suspected of being in some way affiliated with guerrilla activity were murdered wholesale, and the village bulldozed. Methods of torture Blum named include electroshock, uh, needles in the eyes, and castration. Many bodies were found with testicles in their mouths, eyes gouged out or missing hands, a tongue, or breasts. After it was discovered that several key guerrilla leaders were tortured, several other torture survivors came forward. For example, uh, Diane Ortiz, a nun, uh, related how in 1989 she was kidnapped burned with cigarettes, raped repeatedly, and lowered into a pit full of corpses and rats. A fair-skinned man who spoke with an American accent seemed to be in charge, she said. Blum goes on to explain that the annual, the annual payments of 5 to 7 million in military aid for Guatemala continued through the Bush senior and Clinton presidencies, despite the Council on Hemispheric Affairs stating it has the worst human right rights record uh, in Latin America. Chapter 54, El Salvador, 1980 to 1994. In 1960, several thousand students of the National University staged a protest against the curtailment of civil liberties. The government responded by sending in police who systematically smashed offices, classrooms, and laboratories, beat up the school's president, killed a librarian, bayoneted students, and raped dozens of young women. Finally, when the students amassed, an, uh, amassed anew, troops opened fire upon them point blank. New York Times noted, in El Salvador, American aid was used for police training in the 1950s and 60s, and many officers in the three branches of the police later became leaders of the right-wing death squads that killed tens and thousands of people in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Blum explains that the CIA and the U.S. military paid and played an essential role in the conception and organization of the security agencies from which the death squads emanated. CIA surveillance programs routinely supplied these agencies with information on and the whereabouts of various individuals who wound up as death squad victims. The New York the New York Times has published an interview with a deserter from the Salvadoran Army who described a class where several methods of torture were demonstrated on teenage prisoners. He stated that eight U.S. military advisors, apparently Green Berets, were present. Another Salvadoran, a former member of the National Guard, later testified, I belong to a squad of 12. We devoted ourselves to torture and to finding people whom we were told were guerrillas. I was trained in Panama for nine months by the unintelligible of the United States for anti guerrilla warfare. Part of that time, we were instructed about torture. In 1984, 
Amnesty International reported that it had received regular, often daily reports identifying El Salvador's regular security and military units as responsible for torture, disappearances, and killing of non-combatant civilians. Types of torture reported by those who had survived arrest and interrogation included beatings, sexual abuse, use of chemical disor disorients, mock executions, and the burning of flesh with sulfuric acid. Blum explains that the situation in El Salvador, got, as it got worse, it became difficult for the government to justify aid. So they would attach a aid to El Salvador to nicer sounding bills, such as uh, food for the hungry in Africa, uh, or a bill to help uh, heating homes for the poor in the United States. Chapter 55, Haiti, 1986 to 1994. Aristide won election in Haiti by 67.5%. Although Aristide didn't succeed in getting any legislation enacted, he did, however, initiate programs in literacy, public health, and agrarian reform, and pressed for an increase in the daily wage, which was often less than $3, a freeze on the prices of basic necessities, and a public works program to create jobs. Blum states, Aristide served less than eight months as Haiti's president before being deposed in on the 29th of September 1991 by a military coup in which many hundreds of his supporters were massacred and thousands more fled to the Dominican Republic or by sea. Blum goes on to explain that the CIA was financing and training all the important elements of the new military regime and a Haitian officer who supported the coup had reported that U.S. intelligence officers were present at the military headquarters when the coup took place. In 1986, the CIA created a new organization, the National Intelligence Service, SIN. Uh, it was an instrument of police terror persecuting and torturing Father Aristide's supporters and other subversives and using its CIA training and devices to spy on them. In one of many examples of doublespeak, at the same time that uh, SIN was receiving between half and one million dollars a year in equipment, training, and financial support from the U.S., Congress was withholding about 1.5 million in aid for the, from the Haitian military because of its abuse of human rights. Amongst the worst violators of human rights in Haiti was the Front for the Advancement of Progress in Haiti, F-R-A-P-H. It was actually a front for the army. The paramilitary group spread deep fear amongst the Haitian people with its regular murder, public beatings, arson raids on poor neighborhoods, and mutilation by machete. F-R-A-P-H's leader, Emmanuel Constant, went on to CIA payroll in early 1992. An OAS human rights team was accusing the Haitian regime of murder, rape, kidnapping, detention, and torture in a systematic campaign to terrorize Haitians who wanted a return of democracy and President Aristide. Amnesty International reported the same. Boom concludes with demonstrating that when the U.S. finally did come out against the Haitian military government, Haiti's leaders were told they could take four weeks to resign. They would not be charged with any crimes. They could remain in country if they wished. They could run for the presidency if they wished. They could retain all their assets, no matter how acquired. And those who chose to exile were paid large amounts of money by the United States to lease their Haitian properties. Again, this book is about much more than U.S. support of torture. It covers every CIA and military intervention, including bombings, assassination attempts, blackmail, extortion, major military actions, and minor CIA covert actions. I'd like to see an updated edition of this book address the 10 or so military invasions that have occurred since the book was published. I'd also like to see... Uh, an updated edition tackles CIA rendering, black sites, private military contractors, etc. Uh, however, I understand that much of this information is classified, or if it is released to the public, is released 10, 20 years after the fact. For more information strictly on the U.S. support of torture, uh, aside from William Blum's Killing Hope uh, or Rogue State, I recommend Michael Parenti's book, the Sword and the Dollar, which gives shocking accounts of torture. He also has a lecture, which I'll uh, include. 
Uh, also, the Riot Folk Band, uh, F Water O, has written a song about U.S. support of torture called Pigs Protecting Pigs. To finish my analysis, I want to explain how this text has changed how I think. When I read this text, I had heard a little bit about U.S. foreign policy, predominantly the Gulf Wars, uh, because of the recentness of the Iraq, Pakistan, and Afghanistan wars at the time. I knew that the U.S. had been involved in overthrows and assassinate, uh, assassinations and rigged elections uh, because of the U.S.'s installment of Saddam Hussein to power, uh, the Shah of Iran to power, and the funding of the Mujahideens in Afghanistan. Uh, rather than being rare occurrences as I thought, though, uh, Blum's accounts demonstrate that the U.S. is constantly influencing and manipulating and assaulting other nations of the world. I feel like the quote, they hate us because we don't even know why they hate us, is appropriate here. Much like John Perkins' Confessions of an Economic Hitman uh, demonstrated the pervasive and con continuous manipulation of global economics, uh, William Blum's Killing Hope demonstrates the U.S.'s pervasiveness and continuous manipulation of foreign governments. Since this text, uh, I've come to read others, such as Stephen Kinzer's Overthrow, which gives fewer accounts, but more detailed and fleshed out stories of the accounts given. Uh, Ward Churchill's uh, On the Justice of Roosting Chickens has the same scope as Blum's Killing Hope, but with not nearly the same level of detail. That said, I think nothing could have prepared me for the breadth and depth of U.S. foreign policy presented in this text, and I believe it is a must-read for anyone interested in U.S. foreign policy. If you're interested in William Bloom's analysis, uh, he also puts out an anti-empire report monthly, which contains several articles describing his analysis of current events. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.